Let's talk to Dahlia Schweitzer about going viral. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. This is my favorite time of year. It is October. It is Halloween season. And for me, it's uh, maybe a little bit more than a month long celebration. I've got my Halloween decorations up. I have got some horror films queued up. It's kind of, I got to watch, I got to watch a horror film a day uh, to keep up. And there are plenty of good choices. Um, And today I want to talk to Dahlia Schweitzer, who is the author of Going Viral, Zombies, Viruses, End of the World. Dahlia, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am delighted to be here. We met on, well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't know that I knew you. You, (laughs) there's an excerpt from your book, on the film threat on filmthreat.com actually we ran an excerpt of your book which i thought was amazing and then you were on ethan minker's watch party for the film uh man in camo mm-hmm. this was uh this was in september which seems like three years ago. <laughs> i think we're still in march yeah I, I know it just it's so weird how time time has kind of shifted but um, this this book, which I will admit I have not read, uh, I, I think that the premise of it is so incredible. You also teach a course um, related to the book. Tell me the premise for the book and how you are basically a predictor of the future. The premise for the book um, is I look at what I call outbreak narratives. Um, and outbreak narratives are films not like Philadelphia, there are films where there's an outbreak that you know um, takes over the U.S., takes over the world. Uh, movies like Outbreak, Contagion, World War Z, right? Those are all outbreak narratives. So I look at outbreak narratives and I see sort of like patterns that repeat over and over again in those movies. And then I also look at places where they diverge. Uh, And so the book is broken up into three sections and I talk about outbreak narratives that directly engage with globalization and really link globalization to our increased vulnerability to disease. And then I look at outbreak narratives that integrate terrorism, which shockingly became uh, much more popular after 9-11. And then I look at the most recent incarnation, which I call the post-apocalyptic outbreak narrative. And that's the one where the virus has already happened, society has already collapsed, and that's where you get into 28 Days Later, The Walking Dead, all those kinds of movies. Um, And so I sort of trace those three different types of outbreak narratives and then sort of talk about how Hollywood is working with Washington DC and media to sort of like commodify fear and how we're basically being told like what to be afraid of. Well, it's interesting because the US military actually has plans. Like if there were, they do these scenarios and they get think tanks together and try to figure out, well, if there was a zombie outbreak, how would, what would be the US military response? And it's interesting, um, I read after 9-11 that uh, the military got together a bunch of Hollywood screenwriters and had them sit in a group and then discuss like, okay, what are possibilities? What are other ways that, um, you know, that terrorists might, might try to attack the United States? Just sort of wild, interesting theories. I feel like I feel like your book touches on that in a way. I feel like the US military should read your book is what I'm saying. Well they probably already have. Um, <laughs> I kind of I, I joke that I feel like I'm probably on like a watch list somewhere because I've done so many suspicious Google searches about terrorism and Ebola. Um, but yeah Carl you have a lot of, and I talk about this in my class, is that sort of, um, you know, truth imitates fiction, imitates truth, imitates fiction. It's this whole sort of like chicken the egg thing. Um, and I talk about how like government policy on Ebola changed as a result of reactions to Ebola that were being manipulated by fiction in the US. So the World Health Organization, like had, there's a statement that I quote in my book that talks about how you know, obviously people were being very manipulated by all these movies, even though Ebola is not a risk to anybody in the US, Um, but it became this way to sell magazines and a way to sell movies. And so, you know, it really tapped into this sort of fear. Um, And I talk about how um, Bill Clinton uh, 
his policy on bioterrorism was influenced by a book by Richard Preston, who's the same guy who wrote um, The Hot Zone. Uh, and he, it was a fictitious book, The Cobra Effect. Um, and he bought copies for like all of his, you know, top administrators and was like, you have to read this book and like, was like terrified. And so all this money was thrown at sort of like bioterrorism. And actually in my book, my introduction is really dense. So I apologize if maybe that was the reason that you just couldn't get through it. Um, but I, I actually talk about like, this isn't a new phenomenon. Um, and um, the, the Centers for Disease Control um, have, uh, there's this guy Langmuir who used to be like head um, L-A-N-G-M-U-I-R. I've never heard these names said out loud, so that I just kind of imagine how they're probably said. Um, and so during the Korean War, they were slashing all the sort of medical budgets, right? Because it was like all the money was going to defense. And so Langmuir came up with the idea of disease surveillance. And disease surveillance is really just keeping track of sort of what's happening at various hospitals so that, you know, if one person has a weird flu in Philadelphia and another person has a weird flu in Boston, someone is going to notice and, you know, connect them. Um, but that's all it is. But it was called disease surveillance so that it would sound sort of like sexy and military. And then they could get funding from the Defense Department. So there's just like, there's a lot of these sort of like weird games that are happening behind the scenes. Well, I have to say about your book, um, don't be offended. I don't read any books uh, normally <laughs> just because I spend so much time in front of a screen that um, I limit my time, uh, you know, just reading close up and I listen to books. So I am an audible fanatic. So if I can find your book on Audible, that's, that's... I don't know why it's not on Audible. That's a good question. I should ask my publisher. Well, you should, you should, you should, you should narrate your book. You should do your should. narration. You should. I'm very well listened. I know okay. that, that that's, not, that's a term I'm trying to get into the, into the lexicon here, uh, a well listened person. But uh, it's, I just think what's interesting is, is a books or movies like Contagion kind of prepared us. Cause if you look at Contagion, it kind of predicted everything, including civil unrest. That was the first thing that I thought when the lockdown first happened in March, back in back in March, nine years ago. Um, <laughs> uh, like, like, I thought, oh, there's gonna be civil unrest from this. You tell people they can't work and make money for two weeks, that's gonna affect a lot of people. And now that it's gone on so long, I'm not surprised there's not more civil unrest, but I heard you on a podcast. I'm trying to remember the name of the podcast. What was it? Um, Good is in the details. Good is in the details. That's right. Um, at my understanding, a Pasadena-based podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it all, it all, it's the center of the world. That's where I am. Well, I don't know about that, but um, uh, but it's uh, so I heard you on that. And what's weird is, is this: you were in March when that podcast was recorded, predicting everything that's happening now, and it it it, it freaked me out. It was it was it was crazy. So. Where do you see, based on now, and I feel like the creative mind can kind of come up with these sort of dark scenarios of, of human nature. Do you see where things might be going in our distant future? Because, you know, it could get worse. I feel like it's going to get worse. Um, and I think a lot of pundits are sort of saying that the, the period of time between November and January is going to be a really dark time in America. Um, I think, you know, th there's going to be a lot of civil unrest happening ha in terms of politics, um, regardless of whatever happens in the election, there's, there's going to be a lot of fighting, there's going to be guns, there's, I mean, it's just, it's going to be really scary. And then they say that as soon as people start going indoors, the virus is going to skyrocket again. So I feel like if you think we're doing okay now, it's like, this is the calm before the storm. Uh, it's just depressing that you say that. I, <laughs> I, uh, I agree with your assessment. I just don't want But it's to... really depressing. I know. <sighs> I have to be really careful with how much news I consume each day because otherwise it just, it throws you into a really dark place. Uh, I have felt that as well. I felt that it's been difficult sometimes to focus on, on work. Um, so even though a lot of my work involves escape, movies and discussing movies, although I discuss a lot uh, of, of movies that are documentaries and that like, and that stuff kind of crosses over with 
what's happening now. Um, it's it's interesting where we are at this stage. I kind of feel like we're at this like critical point. I mean, this pandemic is basically just it's it's basically shine a light on everything that's effed up about um, society at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, economic disparity, um, the racial injustice, everything is now magnified. All of our problems are magnified. And I feel like a lot of it, this is going to sound terrible to say, but a lot of our escape, which is sports and entertainment, um, that's not, they used to be the thing that would kind of numb us to ignore those things. As long as, look, I can pay my rent. I can, I, I can eat, drink, whatever. I'm good. But now that that, that possibility is taken away, it's really magnified everything. I am so, grateful every day for streaming video. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, myself as well. Like I, you know, I, obviously I'm kind of a movie addict, film fanatic, whatever you want I've, to say. I've heard that about you. Yeah, but um, but yeah, it's given me an opportunity to actually see movies I would not necessarily have had a chance to see, which is which has been a good break. But I feel like because these things have been removed from us, and sports is just not. You see it in the players too. You can't perform for a stadium with no one's there. You know what it is? I feel like all mm -hmm. of these professional athletes are playing like their mom and dad didn't show up to watch the game, and they're like, you know. 12 years old, right? They just have no enthusiasm or passion because really that, you know, whatever you want to call it, the, that crowd is like a, a participant in the event and you remove that element. Same thing with going to movies. I saw Tenet in a theater in Las Vegas with 10 other people and wow. it was not, not nearly the type of experience. And now, now for various reasons, there were only 10 people, but all the mm -hmm. theaters are being sold at 25% capacity. So 500 seats, you got 125 people in the theater all spread out. Not the same, not nearly as fun as a packed house. Um, and 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 Tenet has effectively is an experiment that bombed. I mean, it did not, um, it's it's I don't think it's gonna recoup. Um, and it's it's not the blockbuster that it should have been. So be, with all of these things taken away from us, like where are we where are we going? And and uh, 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 <laughs> Did you see the really disturbing picture of the baseball game with the audience members that are all cardboard cutouts? Yes, I have seen this. It's depressing. Yeah. Yeah, it's um I feel like there's I feel like we're kind of living um you pointed out before we started recording that 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 like this is the worst season of Black Mirror ever that we're kind <laughs> of all experiencing, but that show like all of the nastiness like um you know everything from social media to the virus to just the civil unrest and the sort of corporate techno authoritarian corporate society that we're catapulting toward i feel like it's accelerated all the bad that you know sci-fi movies from the 80s warned us about yeah I mean, I feel like even like the the forced hysterectomies, I don't know if you read about that breaking news. I mean, that is straight out of a sci-fi horror movie. Yeah, yeah. It's these are these are the things I yeah, it, it's um it's really depressing to see. And when you look at even like classic, you know, science fiction authors, they do tend to predict the future. Mm -hmm. Um and and there are very few optimistic visions of the future that we've seen. What are where, where do you see us turning in 2021? I mean, I know this this answer is going to be disappointing, but I feel like it's like we are just, we're doing like a Thelma and Louise thing right now, and we are just going off that cliff, and I don't know what's on the other end. Like, it's like maybe we're going to land on a river, and it'll be a little bit bumpy, and we'll kind of ride it down, and we'll be okay, or we're all just going to crash and burn and explode. Like, it's just... I don't have children and I I don't know that I'd be able to sleep at night if I had children because I'm not sure, I don't know that the earth is going to survive my lifetime, much less the lifetime of, you know, someone who's like eight or nine years old. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And you look at, you know, the, the economic collapse that I feel like we are on the verge of happening. Like, I feel like we haven't even gotten to the worst of that. Right. Um, and then it's just, 
it's like I just feel like we're at this tipping point and I don't know what's going to happen. I do know that one thing that I've found very interesting is the increase in um, not states' rights, because that's not really what's happening, but sort of like, like the fact that it, it really makes a difference what state you live in. And I feel like there was a period of time, you know, maybe 10 years ago where I don't know that it would have made that much of a difference. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna have your circle of friends and you're gonna live in Alabama, or you're gonna live in Kentucky, or you're gonna live in um, Chicago or whatever, but it's kind of like, doesn't make a huge difference. And now I feel like the differences in the different states is so huge. You know, and it's just, I mean, like I even noticed, you know, like with the with the PPE and the mask wearing and it's like, you know, I, I, I look at the newspaper and I'll be like, wow, I'm glad I don't live there because I don't know how I would deal with it, you know. Um, and so I feel like that might intensify, uh, that it's just going to become more and more pronounced. You know, like if you live in state X, the rules are going to be very different than in state Y. I don't know if that means, I mean, they have this sort of like quarantine, you know, if you drive from Iowa to New York, you're supposed to quarantine for two weeks or whatever. But I don't know if they're going to get stricter about that. I don't know if we're going to have to like show papers on the state border. Um, but that makes me a little bit nervous. But I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. I, I, first of all, yes, I think you are going to have to show papers. I think you're going to have to show papers to travel. You're going to have to show that you're vaccinated. Oh, yeah. You if you go to a major convention like San Diego Comic Con, you'll have to show that um, you know in order to get a badge. Yeah. And my prediction is, if you go to San Diego Comic Con, you're going to get to go into the convention hall. You get your one day to go, and it'll be at 25% capacity. You'll see it incredibly empty, and you'll have this is the day that you can go. There's going to be no four day badges for conventions. Conventions will be these sort of extended experiences and there'll be a live component, but it's going to be with a far reduced audience. Also, I have a prediction that um, more than likely in our lifetime, we will live in the former United States of America, just like Russia, that I feel that that's what's coming. It's it won't. I don't know that it'll be so dramatic like a civil war with the blue and the gray, certainly conflict. But I do believe that we're heading towards that the divide in uh, political ideologies is so vast and there's such an intolerance. And I've seen it amongst my friends. I've seen it in the entertainment industry. I've seen it in just in just in all aspects. The divide is so clear. I can see this happening, uh, you know, maybe maybe not for myself, but my kids, my kids are in their 20s, actually. And thankfully, they uh, got out. Of, they missed social media being a thing. They Good. don't care. They think it's a waste of time. Good. So, and, and both are gainfully employed. My son's a U.S. Marine, so he he clues me, and he travels the world. He tells me a lot of interesting things that are happening um, uh, with with our, our U.S. military. Um, not need like trade secrets or anything. Right. Um, just effectively that, you know, we're downsizing things, right? We're, we're not the military, the tanks, we don't, what do we need tanks for? And there's a great, there's a great shot you can find on social media of this sea, this, this sea of Russian tanks that are all abandoned because wow. why, do you, why do you need tanks when you can? It's all cyber warfare. It's all cyber warfare or viruses or, mm -hmm. You know, there we we're now experiencing in Los Angeles these new this new strain of mosquitoes. I can't stand this. We have these mosquitoes. I, people talk about it. Um, this is not something maybe that's even bubbled up in social media. This is a strain of mosquitoes that, you know, when you hear a mosquito get close to you, it's that buzzing sound. Yeah. Mosquitoes make no noises. So I'll be in my little patio area relaxing and just get eaten alive but you don't you don't hear them they're mosquitoes that make no sounds and they came from china on boats i know? didn't hear about this yeah so no look it up it's for your part two of your book <laughs> but look up i mean in addition to the murder you could do a whole thing on there's murder hornets and now there are these mosquitoes that and the bites are not like these simple bites they stay they're like spider bites they're they're much more intensified. So um, I feel like I feel like uh, horror, 
horror is you don't need to even make up like horror movies are to me the escape like you see like um after 9 11 the torture porn which was not my personal favorite genre i think very few of those movies you know had any sort of merit but but that was big i feel like what is your prediction for we we can predict things are going to get bad especially economically speaking but what what is going to happen to entertainment how is what's in the zeitgeist now because they say we've had all this time locked down if you don't emerge from this with a novel written or a book or a movie whatever like you know you you got to have like you have to come out of this having produced something i find it's incredibly difficult to focus because it's, yeah Movies are movies are frivolous ultimately. I, you know, um, at the end of the day, you don't need it. I I don't know. In addition to looking terrible in leather chaps, I don't know that in the apocalypse I would have much use. Um, other than there are certain movies I could repeat from beginning to end. But you know, I just think that whenever all those post-apocalypse movies, why does everyone wear leather? Is it because it's just it's rugged? It's rugged. Like, it's rugged. Yeah. You just see every time you see it's like a Mad Max film. It's like, you know, it's like uh, it's like a fetish club or something. That's how <laughs> people tend to, tend to dress. I don't know. I Latex, you don't have to clean. But in any, any case, where do you see this? How do you see this affecting like just creative minds and the types of storytelling that, that will be happening going forward? Um, I got a bunch of things. One real fast is latex. You do have to keep moisturized. So I feel like latex would not work well for the apocalypse. Um, it doesn't breathe. It doesn't, it doesn't breathe. And it doesn't breathe. Yeah. That's right, right, no right. one's, no one's wearing latex. Um, I would say that um, there were some interesting articles that were written after nine 11 um, that said that quoted people who had survived nine 11, you know, who had been downtown and had been in the towers and they said that they were, they sort of knew what to do when the towers came crashing down because they'd seen zombie movies. Wow. So just because you say that you feel like you don't have a lot of merit in the, you know, in an apocalyptic world, you might be wrong because I feel like a lot, and I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, the CDC and the army have these sort of like what to do in case of a zombie outbreak. Um, not because they really think that people are going to come back from the dead, but because those kinds of scenarios do encapsulate sort of possibilities that maybe we haven't really thought of in like logical, rational ways. But it's like, you know, because nobody, nobody would have thought like, oh, the, you know, the towers are going to come crashing down. And it's, you know, like no one imagined that sort of scenario. Um, and so I think watching a lot of movies can teach you how to prepare for this sort of event. So you might be more qualified than you think. Um, also, uh, I think what else is interesting is, and we touched on this a while ago, and I wanted to kind of just circle back to it. Um, before 9-11, you, you had a lot of these movies and TV shows that had you know, the terrorism happening and you had like bioterrorism. Um, and I don't know if you remember that that show 24 with Kiefer Sutherland, yeah. where the um, the initial premiere got postponed because of 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then they actually like, they like re-edited the pilot or like the pilot got switched with the third episode or something because in the pilot for 24, there is a woman who hijacks the plane. And it's just so unnerving. I think, and it's and they they say that because it was you know twenty four was consulting with the CIA, and the CIA knew that something like this was going to happen. So whoever was working with the writers of twenty four obviously gave them this idea because it was in the zeitgeist. And then lo and behold, it happens in real life. So I, there is this really weird truth fiction. Um, that said we are kind of off the reservation because it's like, I don't think like no one has any idea what's going to happen. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like one, I have like these sort of this, these list of words that I am so sick of hearing over the last couple of years. And one of them is unprecedented. And it's just like every day there is something unprecedented, you know, and it's like that word just needs to be retired. Um, and I think so like nobody knows, like it's like the idea 
like I think Rachel Maddow was talking about how um, when the Bob Woodward tapes came out that showed that you know Trump actually knew how dangerous the virus was, and she was saying something about how like in any other presidency, or I think she even said like in any other TV show in which this was playing out, that's the point at which the president resigns. You know, like that's the normal response. And instead it's just sort of like, let's carry on and let's post a tweet about Joe Biden being a pedophile. I mean, it's just, you know, we are so far off the reservation that it's really hard to kind of know what's gonna happen next week, much less what's gonna happen. I mean, I, it seems kind of like a lazy answer, but I do feel like animation is gonna become uh, kind of big just because that can be handled really well during the pandemic and you don't have to worry. And it's like right now, all these TV shows are sort of on hiatus because they can't film. And so it's like animation seems to be the total no, no brainer. So I, I think that we're gonna get a lot of animation, which I know is not, not a great answer, but I do think that's kind of the reality. I do, I do think animation will blow up. I think that also screen-based movies, um, movies that take place all over uh, a, a screen. Um, I, I think there was that uh, John Cho film, Searching, which I think is, br I don't know if you've seen that film. I haven't. I thought, I thought it was, I thought that was amazing. Uh, I, I thought it was just an, an, an incredible. It, it's it, I, I, I got choked up during parts of it. It's, it's, it's basically like an Alfred Hitchcock thriller, but all takes place on screens. Wow, and a, 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 a young girl's disappearance. In, incredible film, searching. Um, definitely I, check that one out. I do think, yeah, animation. I think is is going to blow up, and I just think that, like, I think leaning into what's happening. I don't understand why this sounds crazy. A friend of mine was. Um, I, I have friends who I have friends who work in entertainment. When you live out here, <laughs> you're just going to have friends who work in entertainment. So, a buddy of mine was like an extra, and he worked on a CIS show and he just told me how weird it was everyone had to get tested for covid like three times they all had like masks and things like on the side they take the mask off they act in the scene they put the mask back on and they socially distance but they're shooting tv shows right now they have they all, are yes they are they have all these insane rules that make production incredibly expensive and by expensive i mean someone else is making a lot of money Right. Um, so, which which is sucks for independent film production. I think part of it is going to be you're going to see a lot of um, film production go to other countries where the outbreaks are not as severe. Although, Canada. you know, Robert, Robert pa yeah, exactly, Canada, New Zealand, you know, these other countries that maybe have you know far fewer cases. You know, you fly in, you quarantine for a bit, you get your test, and then you know. Then you just sort of hunker down, almost like you know, a dorm room style. Like no one goes outside of the group of a couple hundred people working on a blockbuster film. I think blockbusters will be able to do that. I think indies have to get far more creative, which is why I think your assessment about animation. I think we're going to see probably more indie animation and um, and movies that are done. I mean, I'm working on a documentary right now, and I'm doing interviews using a streaming platform, right? Like a a video chat platform like like we are on right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there'll be more movies like that. There was a movie called You Don't Know Me. It's about the movie Showgirls. Oh yeah, the Know Me, N-O-M-I. N-O-M-I, oh, great doc. It's a great like distillation. Uh, if you're gonna watch a movie tonight, highly recommend that doc, whether you're a Showgirls fan or not. But it's it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen about a movie. And it, and the whole movie, the filmmaker didn't shoot any footage. Right. He did all of his interviews. A lot of people interview, but there are no there are no talking heads in this documentary. It's all audio. So he has audio, and then the audio he runs over clips and other footage. And there was he shot no footage for this doc. So wow. the indie filmmakers. I mean, look, indie filmmakers struggle regardless like just if you even if you know the deck is already stacked against you anyways as, as an indie filmmaker now throw all this in i think it's going to force indies to to reevaluate and the doc that would have been made for say two or three hundred grand is going to have to be made for 50 grand and more creatively the um director of that doc jeffrey McHale, he's an editor who works on 
traditional entertainment shows. And he just did all of his interviews on, on like zoom and recorded it with a good mic. And that's, that's how he did it. So I think that sort of those um, being faced with that adversity will force filmmakers to be more creative in how, how they do it. Um, what they're going to talk about. I just don't understand why they don't just make a show that's set during the pandemic. I know, I'm waiting for that to happen. Although there's the, the Corona Zombies. Movie. Yes, Corona Zombies, yeah. which, um, yeah, oh my God. Um, I talked to Charlie Band, actually interviewed him for the podcast and we, we talked and he made that like right as things went down and he knew it was gonna be bad because of what was happening. He had friends in Italy and they told him how bad it was. And as soon as he knew it arrived in the US, of course, Charlie Band just thinks I'm gonna make a movie, you know, like, but I also feel like I know you were saying with the indie filmmakers and things being, you know, everything stacked against you. I feel like it also could conversely work to their benefit because there's going to be this scarcity of material, you know, this, this scarcity of content. And so maybe that will open the playing field a little bit. I, I do believe that. I do believe that indies are set for, I actually believe that this is kind of a renaissance for indies to kind of reinvent your expectations for indie films. I think there've been a lot of movies, I call them a million dollars down the toilet starring <laughs> fill in the blank. And it's usually some actor that's of note. They want to kind of stretch themselves and they, they will star in a small indie movie and they're generally not very good. Um, what I prefer to discover are these really small indie movies where they, they're, to me, they're like birds with broken wings. They're, they're flawed. They're flawed, right. Right? but you want to heal them. You want that bird to fly away to whatever success it's going to have. And that's how I see a lot of indie movies is, yes, there's this aspect that's flawed, or maybe they don't have, but they've got amazing ideas. Indie sci-fi has kind of blown up. I don't know if you're familiar. I don't know. I, another book that I wrote that I'm sure you haven't read about this movie called Office Killer. And Office Killer is the baby bird that I rescued on the side of the road and has really? become my sort of like labor of love. Yes. So well, I, I can confess I have read none of your books. But, <laughs> but this is but you need to re, you need to read your book to me. You're, okay. that, that's what needs to happen. You need the audio books. I actually did an audio book that's on Amazon. It's not it's a terrible thing. I did it as a goof. It's called Celebrities Poop. And it's a parody, it's a parody of um, the, the, the book Everyone Poops, which is one of the top selling children's books of all times. But I did a parody of that book, but with like Donald Trump is in it and Howard Stern and- Oh, wow. You know, like, and my daughter actually did the paintings and it's done in the style of everyone poops that sort of Oprah's in it, Justin Bieber, um, you know, it's, and it's, it's an exact parody of the everyone poops book. Okay. And I did an audio book where I read it, read the book to an audience in Phoenix and then released it as an audio book. What I'm saying, my long winded way of saying this is you can publish your own audio book of, I don't know what your rights situation is. Yeah. I'll have to look into that with the academic I books. It's not, I mean, it's like, look, I, I've talked to friends who have done audiobooks of their books. It's not an easy thing. I mean, you got to like, you got to take it like a chunk a day. You can't read. I mean, most books are what, like uh, 50, 60,000 words, about five or six hours. So what, you can read 10,000 words in an hour? Is that the, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I have looked it up. So I'm actually, what I'm saying is fairly accurate, okay. but uh, <laughs> I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to be coy, but um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a possibility. And Amazon has like a program where you can do that. I'm sure you could do it through your publisher that they could publish it. And I'm just, I'm addicted to audiobooks. I'm in the audible. I'm not, these are no plugs. There is nothing tied in. We only have one sponsor, which is uh, Storyblocks. So if so you maybe got, Audible I, wants to sponsor you. Well, yeah. At, at some point I'll figure out how to make whatever it is I'm doing a success. I, I think that not quitting, not quitting something I started out of high school is probably just sort of one key. But um, yeah, if you go to storyblocks.com slash film threat, look, I'm going to throw up the little plug right now. Mm. If you're a filmmaker, we, we use storyblocks um, in videos that we edit and create. It's just like, it's like a million plus stock footage. Those things are really expensive to license stock footage. 
And if you pay this monthly fee, I can't believe I just did a plug in, our, in the midst of our conversation. That's like, fantastic. I need to tell my students about this. You should. Yeah, I'll put it up again. So if you go to this, it's it's a very small monthly fee, okay. but you have access to every. You can make a feature film just based on like stock footage that they have on this site. It's it's an amazing resource, and I was a customer of it and approached them and I said, "Would you want to like?" sponsor our podcast and because i because i used their stuff so often it's also like special effects tools and audio and everything is cleared when you pay their fee you just have full rights to use their stuff and then it's also like a marketplace where you can request certain things it's it's great like i've interviewed a lot of doc filmmakers that actually have used it in their productions and then i have to do the plug at the end so uh, but we're not done. We we still have more to discuss. Now, tell me about like I'm curious. You are a professor. Yes. In the academia. Yes. Which is an interesting space to be in right now. Yes. I feel like <laughs> a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff happening in academia at this moment. But I'm curious where you see because that's one of the things I personally have always loved having written a book about how to get your movie into film festivals. I. I do enjoy mentoring young filmmakers and creatives as they come up. Basically, I just don't want to see them fuck up and make mistakes that I see other filmmakers make. And I specifically wanted the first edition of the book was really inspired um, by a filmmaker who uh, made this movie that was a great film, but he had no idea what he was doing at a film festival. He didn't have a press kit. He didn't know what to do. And um, I thought, well, I gotta just, I gotta spell out all the things you need to do. This, my, but, but I'm just curious where you are in academia. I feel like it's very gratifying to just pass on some information to make sure students are not gonna get themselves into trouble. But there's a whole new generation of indie filmmakers that are coming up. What do they think about things? What are their stories, and how do you instruct them? Um. I do not teach production courses. And uh, it's funny because every once in a while a student asks me, you know, why don't I teach production courses? Because I think, you know, why wouldn't everyone want to work in Hollywood? I mean, that's, just, you know, that's like the, the, the Mecca. Um, and I explain to them that I have no interest because I don't like working with other people. Uh, and they always kind of laugh and then I, tell them a story about how I was originally a film major at college and I was AD on a student film um, my sophomore year, I believe. And it was such a terrible experience. I'm still friends with the director. And like when we reconnected years ago, he came up to me and he said, you know, I just, I just want to apologize for that film. And it was like, I'm a very good AD. I'm very type A, I'm good at managing people, like I'm just very good at, you know, creating these sort of well-oiled machines, but I really don't like to work with other people. And so I have zero interest in production. It's just like, they're just, they're too many moving parts. And so I am happiest when I am left alone. Uh, and so I became a writer about film rather than someone who actually creates the content. And what's interesting is at FIT where I teach, uh, it's a, a program where everyone comes there for film production. And it's very hands-on and you know, really from you know, your first day, you are picking up equipment and you're making stuff and it's very, very production oriented. And I actually have like a little spiel that I tell the, new, the incoming freshmen on like their sort of orientation day um, on why they should take my classes because I know that they're all probably thinking, why am I taking this class? And I actually have, I'm teaching a film theory course now and I, I literally just had a student last week who, who said, I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally understanding why we're supposed to be taking this class. Uh, so they wanna just go make stuff, you know? And so I'm like the thorn in their side. Uh, but what's really gratifying is I feel like I, I'm, it's like the Wizard of Oz and I peel back the curtain and I'm showing them the, you know, the man behind the curtain, but it's almost like 
I don't know if this metaphor is going to hold up, but it's almost like the opposite. It's almost like they see the man and I pull back the curtain and then I show them that they're all these like moving parts that are behind the curtain. So what's behind the curtain is actually more impressive than what's in front of the curtain, you know? So my goal is to sort of teach them, you know, like it's almost like they see film as a sort of, you know, oh, it's like a two dimensional, you know, communication tool. And it's like, oh my God, but there's so much going on, you know, and, and to teach them about um, all the political messages that are woven into it and the racist messages and the misogynistic messages. And, you know, I, I kind of, I go across the board. So, you know, we, we have, I have a lecture where I talk about cinematography, you know, and we just talk about different kinds of shots and what the effect of those different kinds of shots could be. And, you know, how color is used in film, you know, like really like kind of nuts and bolts stuff. Um, but then, you know, in the going viral course, uh, we talk about how we are taught what to fear through Hollywood entertainment, you know, and the fact that after 9-11, Carl Rove went to Hollywood and sat down with screenwriters and was sort of like and producers and was like, okay, you know, this is a really complicated narrative because we are now going to war with Al Qaeda. And we're not used to that, right? We're used to going to war with a country. So we need to figure out a way to simplify the narrative so that the American public understands who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. And so we need to, um, we need to kind of like filter this message through mass media entertainment. Uh, and I actually, um, I wrote an article, uh, there was like a special issue of the Journal of Popular Culture that was talking about how the government will influence sort of fictional narratives. Um, and so I wrote an article about how the government influences narratives about health. Uh, and it's crazy, like there is, there's, uh, there's an, an organization in Hollywood called Hollywood Health and Society, and their job is basically just to act as a liaison between like the Centers for Disease Control and Hollywood. So, for instance, um, there's an episode of How to Get Away with Murder from I don't even remember what season where they talk about this new drug that's called PrEP. Um, and it's pre-exposure prophylactic that was sort of like, uh, it, re it reduces your chances of getting AIDS. Um, and the amount of like back behind the scenes labor that went into sort of coordinating that because this, you know, the, the Centers for Disease Control wanted more people to know about PrEP because it was still this relatively new thing. So it's like, they know that the best way to disseminate messaging is through mainstream media. So it's like Centers for Disease Control are meeting with the writers from how to get away with murder to figure out, you know, how to best, um, you know, transmit the sort of the correct messaging about this new drug. Um, and you have, I mean, there are other stories like uh, even just like um, Beverly Hills 90210, uh, Centers for Disease Control wanted to really communicate the messaging behind, you know, the importance of wearing sunscreen and skin cancer. And so Ian Ziering on one episode notices that he's got a mole and it's like, oh my God, I need to go get tested for skin cancer. And that, did not just organically come up in the writer's room. I mean, that was like, you know, again, behind the scenes labor with the Centers for Disease Control. And so like Hollywood Health and Society will organize these like panels, these events, and the Centers for Disease Control will be like, well, this, these are our current issues that we're trying to push. So we'd really appreciate it if you could kind of focus on X, Y, Z. Um, and then they also work the other way where if you're working on a TV show and you want to have a scene with the virus and you want it to be authentic, um, you go to Hollywood Health and Society and then they'll connect you with an epidemiologist who'll be like a consultant on the show and all that. So I think most people don't realize how much is happening behind the scenes. And so I think that's sort of like one of the things that I try to show in my classes is just, you know, yes, movies are pretty pictures, but it's just like, there's so much going on in terms of power and politics and race and gender and all that. And so that's, that's sort of my not so secret agenda. It, it, it's funny what you're saying is it's not, it doesn't sound much different than, you know, in the movie theaters in the forties running like, you know, commercials to buy us bonds. Right. It's, it's, 
a um, collusion, if you will, between <laughs> between Hollywood and mainstream movie, you know, between the, our government and mainstream Hollywood to release certain narratives. Mm -hmm. So no, it just it's become more subtle than that, you know, and it's it's kind of like you see it with like product placement, right? You know, it's right. because as commercials become this sort of like dying medium, right? Because nobody watches commercials anymore. So all of these companies are trying to figure out, well, how am I going to sell my overpriced watch? And it's like, well, I'm going to get Tom Cruise to wear it in the next Mission Impossible movie. Or it's like um, the company Funny or Die, which um, Funny or Die does these funny videos, but a lot of them are brands, brands, or film, so it's basically a commercial agency that creates content that weaves in, um, you know, whatever they're selling. Uh, you know, it, it was certainly apparent when um, Barack Obama appeared on Zach Galifianakis's show. Oh yeah, between the palms. Yeah, yeah, between two ferns. Between two ferns. Sorry, yes. Ferns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so when he was on there, he was, you know, obviously selling uh, sign up for uh, Obamacare, um, and that was done by funny or die. So it's, I just think what's interesting is, and it sounds like what you, you've done in your course is something that I, I kind of, I kind of had this awakening in college, which led to a lot of how film threat, you know, the reason film threat is where it is, it, it, is it's just sort of like, if you can become aware that these messages are woven into, you know, um, fictional narratives, whether it's television or movies, you can at least choose whether to be influenced by it. Right. right. I, can, I mean, some of these narratives are not particularly nefarious or evil. Some of them are actually positive narratives, um, you know, racial tolerance, uh, among others, uh, are, are positive narratives. And then I think there are ones where why are they doing this? I don't know. There's a lot there's a lot to question these days. I feel like I feel like there's a whole. And what's what's interesting is to is observing how social media has become such a tool now. Um, I would recommend, and I don't. If you're keeping track, if you're keeping score now, I think we've recommended four or five movies, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of books. But a movie I would recommend, it's on Netflix now, is The Social Dilemma, which I, I interviewed the director recently on the Film Threat YouTube channel. Just you know, I never ask anyone who watches this, if if anyone watches this, to subscribe to our channel, to like and share. But every YouTuber, this is probably why my channel's not really growing at all. <laughs> you have to plug it. So like and share and subscribe, but you can, and you could watch my interview with uh, the director of uh, The Social Dilemma, but that movie blew my mind because in a very simple way, and I mean this uh, like as a positive, like he spelled out and he does it through this, through this sort of fun, this sort of narrative story that runs throughout. I mean, he interviews people documentary style, but then he has this sort of fictionalized family and how social media affects them. And then it shows, he sort of anthropomorphizes social media algorithms. This is not, you got to see it, right? Okay. So, I've just heard that it's problematic. And so I've kind of, I've been bracing myself before oh, watching it. That's a, just a throwaway <laughs> thing to, that's a problematic <laughs> way of saying, I don't want to discuss a complicated thing. It's, it's. No, no, no. Like in my sort of like academic Twitter feeds and stuff, people are very worked up about it. Oh God, I don't know why it's. I don't know what would work you up because it's it's an introduction to a conversation about this, that the, right. the levers, the sort of algorithms and these bots are levers that get you to pay attention to social media. I mean, one of the things I do when I download any app, I never turn on the notifications. If oh, I, God, no. If I choose to engage with an app, it's because I chose to do it and not because boom, a notification popped up. I feel, the, and, and what's interesting is, you know, the default setting for any downloading any app is turn your notifications on. And I'm like, no, I don't need to know. If I'm going to go to uh, Marco Polo, I will, that's an app actually. That's a real, <laughs> app. That's, it's a real thing. It's, uh, it's like a chat app where you talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, it's for quick communication, uh, but video. Anyways, um, I turn the notifications off for everything. I just, I don't like that as a default setting. I like to choose, and this is something, this was from the early days of film threat, we had this sort of slogan, our slogan, which was not well thought out. We didn't exactly, I'm not, I, it's, it's taken many years to get to this place, but 
become aware was the thing is just to like, once you, it's almost, um, it, it's, it's like putting on those glasses um, and just being able to see all the subliminal messaging. Oh my God. And they live. Exactly. I, just, they live. I just showed my students that clip last week. That well, I mean, that's a movie that should be remade, in my opinion, because it's even more relevant now than ever. That film, that subliminal messages are in everything, and they're not—they're not even subliminal now. They're right. just—they're just like right out there. So, um, I—I I don't know. You know what? It's problematic. It's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of problems. Well, I think that the social dilemma—the social dilemma should just be a series an ongoing series that just comes out every, every month. There's like a new episode that is talking about news in the, in the realm of social media, because I feel it is such, um, if you can here, I'm going to rec, I'm going to recommend a book. I'm, you know what? And I listened oh, to that. I listened to this book. It's Jerry Lanier's 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now. Um, highly recommend this book. I have listened to it, and uh, it, it it really shows the all the tools that the social media companies use to manipulate us into yeah. outrage, into pitting people against each other. I mean, really, if you look at it, the mainstream media is fear porn, and social media is uh, rage porn. Mm -hmm. Hey, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> United States? Are we united? I no, don't know. No, no, I feel, no. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I really do fear for the future of this country and and where we're going. And and um, I, I, I have done my best to push back about uh, push back when it comes to any sort of divisive rhetoric. I do not like it. Um, so yeah, I feel like some divisive rhetoric is unavoidable, though. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. That, I mean, that's the age we live in. Um, yeah. Dahlia Schweitzer, we have to. You have to come back. You're, normally, our normally our conversations of the podcast like 15, 20 minutes, thirty minutes. This is uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, and we haven't talked about horror movies yet. We haven't even talked about. You know what? Yeah, we're gonna go long. What is this digital space? <laughs> Let's talk about. It is October. It is my favorite month of the year. Um, Halloween truly is my favorite holiday. No relatives is fantastic. There's no relatives. You can just, there's no fighting. There's no relatives. We're going to celebrate whatever costume you have, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, so let's talk about, I want to hear Dahlia Schweitzer's October Halloween movie picks and your reasons to watch those. Well, I can, I can actually tell you that I've, I've written another book that you're not going to read um, that's going to come out next year that's called Haunted Homes. And I look at... Um, movies and TV shows where there are haunted houses um, and sort of unpacking, you know, what that says about America and American suburbia and all that. And I, I do this thing where um, this, your audience is probably the, the only audience that won't think I'm really weird for doing this, but I will curate little mini film festivals for myself mm -hmm. um, because it's really laborious to constantly be like, what movie am I gonna watch now? Um, so I'll kind of be like, okay, I'm like, I, it was after the election in 2016 and I needed something to just take my mind off things. And when I was a kid, I had always been really afraid of, of horror movies. I just thought they would be really terrifying. So I didn't watch, I haven't watched like any of them. And so I decided I was going to go back and just catch up. And so I watched like all the Nightmare on Elm Street. I watched all the Halloween movies. Um, I watched, I even, I thought that I watched all the Amityville movies until I went to the Amityville movie Wikipedia page and there's like 80 and I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> you have to draw the line somewhere. But I watched a lot of Amityville movies and it was actually uh, watching those movies that sort of inspired this book um, where I was like, you know, God, this, and it's funny because all my books start with this sort of like really almost naive, simplistic kind of query. Um, so like going viral started with uh, me thinking about the fact that I had learned about AIDS at the same time that I learned about sex. And there was never a time where I knew about one and not the other. That was just the generation in which I grew up. And I was like, God, that's so weird because, you know, 
intimacy used to be thought of as being this very healing, desirable thing. And then with AIDS, intimacy became deadly. And I was like, God, I wonder how that's going to spill over into movies and to sort of like, you know, interpersonal contact and intimacy and all that. And that was the innocent question that sort of led to going viral. Um, and with this one, with the Haunted Homes book, it was like, you know, God, the, the home is always seen as being this safe space, right? This is like, you know, like you go home, you close the door and it's like, oh, you're okay. And in all these movies, the home is the most dangerous place. And, you know, you don't breathe that sigh of relief until your characters are driving away and the home is receding in the rear view mirror. Um, and so I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, and so I just started watching all these movies about haunted homes. Um, and so I have my sort of number one recommendation, which probably everyone's already seen um, for a Halloween movie would be Hereditary. And I was not prepared to be scared the way that Hereditary scared me. Um, Cause I, you know, I, I'm, when you're writing a book, you just watch so many of these movies and then a lot of them are really formulaic and it's just kind of like the same things over and over again. And I put Hereditary in and it kind of starts sort of slow. And so you're just like, okay, it's, you know, family, melodrama, whatever. And then it just like, whoa, what happened? And I had to sleep with the lights on after I watched Hereditary, which is a little bit embarrassing, but that movie is terrifying. Wow. Well, the last time I slept with the light on um, watching a horror film was John Carpenter's The Thing. Ooh, okay. Uh, that just- How old were you? I was, I believe I was 16. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's, um, I got a car so that I could see every movie that opened in a theater on, on, on a weekend. That's, I didn't care about, I cared less about girls, so to speak, and more cared about like, I wanted to see all the movies that opened in a weekend. <laughs> I had to do that. So yeah, John Carpenter's a thing. I was 16 and it opened in theaters, was at 82. Um, and I uh, slept with the light on, scared the crap out of me in that movie. Actually, just from a, I feel like there's a lot in that movie. You could remake the thing now, but with the pandemic, it's like, who has it? And you're asymptomatic and this. I mean, as they're describing, as Fauci is describing all the aspects of the virus, I'm like, oh, this is the thing. Yeah. This is, I mean, I even made a joke about, you know, when McCready like, takes the he takes the sort of heated end of that metal piece and puts it in the the, the thing with the blood and like the monster comes out like that's that's our coronavirus test i guess but they've, re they've remade it once or twice they remade it once it was not great the, okay. the original is amazing and i do yeah. recommend it uh in 4k if you can see it in 4k i own all these movies you're talking about but but um, what are some uh, some of the other ones that you would you would recommend for the month of October, which is my horror viewing month? Um, let's see. Uh, Get Out, of course, is a classic. Um, that I saw I'm it in Biden recently. There was a retrospective screening. Oh, wow. of and I saw it was fantastic. Um, what are some other ones that I talk about? There's, uh, I watched, a, I watched a bunch of sort of, uh, like sort of old TV movies. And I think like some of them I, I managed to find on YouTube, which by the way, is, I know we were kind of criticizing social media and stuff, but like YouTube is sort of a gift for like movies that have gone out of print. Um, wow. and there's this movie called the entity. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'm going to just confirm that that's what it's called. One of the problems that I had when I was working on this book is that all the movies have this sort of very similar titles. Mm. Um, and so it became incredibly hard for me to keep track. But yes, it, The Entity, it came out in uh, 1983. Um, it's an American wow. supernatural horror film. And it is really freaky because, and this is one of the things that I sort of get into in the book in terms of like gender, because for uh, for women in real life off screen, the home is often the most dangerous place. Um, and one of the things that we were, you were sort of talking about how, you know, movies are very escapist and horror movies are very escapist, but horror movies can also become a place to play out these sort of real life fears in a way that's sort of safe. like. Um, Rod Serling um, had this quote uh, with the Twilight Zone where he was saying something like, um, you know, like I can, 
I can say things with the Martian that I wouldn't be able to say with the, you know, the, I'm terrible at remembering quotes. You're looking at me like you have no idea what I'm saying. I, I don't about. know this quote, but I love Roger. Okay, okay I'm going to find the quote. Um, but he had a quote that was basically like, I can say things with a Martian that I'd never be able to say with like an actual, like an actual person. Right. Um, and it was just this kind of idea that, uh, you know, you have this liberty when it's sort of fantastical that you wouldn't have. Um, but here he said, I found that it was all right to have Martians saying things Democrats and Republicans could never say. Wow. Well, I mean, that uh, science fiction and fiction in general is always like been a platform to be able to talk about things that are either too uncomfortable uncom exactly. or controversial. I mean, the original Star Trek series, if you look at especially the first season, there are so many issues dealt with. It was never given, I don't think that the original Star Trek series was ever given enough credit for the number of issues that it tackled. And in a way that wasn't, I think the problem with a lot of when, you know, uh, writers are dealing with issues of today in today's science fiction, they do it in such an obvious way that there's really no, they're not like it's the, the story is secondary to the political messaging. And right. in the original Star Trek series, there was a story, the political messaging was just underneath the surface, right? It was like, it was like the, um, it was, it was like the surprise in, inside a fifth Avenue chocolate bar, if I might reference a very obscure <laughs> chocolate bar, um, the nougat, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I prefer that. I think that, I think that, I mean, I can, I can point to so many films that have had an impact on me that, that um, made me think differently about the issue. And I feel like it's better achieved when it's done under the surface instead of so on top of it, right? Like, um, I, I, you know, uh, I'm talking about like the original Star Trek series. The new Star Trek series, I think, are just don't don't they don't handle politics well now. And I feel like back back in the original series, they so wove it underneath that it worked on you in a, in a in a better, more effective way. Right. So, um, but to go back to the entity, um, yeah. it's because it's it's a crazy movie, and Barbara Hershey is a woman who lives alone. Um, or she's a single mother, she has a kid. Um, but she is raped by this sort of paranormal creature. And she has the bruises. I mean, she has like, there's like the physical signs that something's happening to her, um, but nobody believes her. And so it, again, it just, it, like it hits so uncomfortably close to home. Um, and she's even going to like a psychiatrist and he's talking about how she's like, she's making up these stories and, it's like no, she's she's literally being raped in her home, and no one will believe her. Uh, and so, just to me, that that it's like it's so chilling, and it's not chilling because it's got ghosts. You know, it's chilling because it's like this woman is not believed, and she has the she has bruises, and like they still won't believe her, and they think that she's like doing them to herself and everything. Um, and uh, I love the Conjuring movies. Um, I I'm yeah. not quite sure what happened. To that creative team because I feel like they kind of lost and some of their recent movies have just been really disappointing mm. um but the like the first two conjuring movies are just fantastic like those are classics and those were also ones that sort of helped solidify my interest in writing this book but I do think that any horror film franchise they, they sort of go along a trajectory of you know the, the first few movies are good and then they get forgettable. And then there are so many, like the Friday the 13th series, you can't even keep track. Oh, you should how. you should check out the Amityville Wikipedia page. There, There is one. Okay. Oh, so. the, 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 the number of movies, yeah, it, it puts everything else to shame. And they, I, I'm a little bit neurotic, and so I was like, well, I'm gonna watch all of them because I like to be very thorough. And then at one point, I just like, there's a movie um, where some dad who like goes and he takes a clock from the Amityville house and he brings the clock back to his like suburban home. And then that sets off all these like evil events um, because he has the clock. And I was just like, okay, this is, this is so much of a stretch. Like that was when I was like, okay, I'm enough. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of Amityville movies that I 
have well, not seen. Interesting you mentioned home because home is so associated. I mean, that word is a sort of, in a sense, a positive trigger word in the in the sense that you think of home, you think of family, you think of love, you think mm -hmm. so that being a threat, a home, like like something evil coming to home is is probably uh I mean just one of the more horrific types of horror films. You mentioned hereditary, which uh, what I really loved seeing that film was not knowing anything about it when I saw it. I didn't read review. Mm -hmm. Just went to see it, and Ari Aster's follow-up, uh, *Midsummer*, I actually really liked a lot. Oh, we'll fight about that then. Oh, you will. You did not. You did not like that. I uh, hated it. Hated I hated it. it. Yeah. Hated it. Oh wow. No, I I found it. I I, I, I the fact that it's also beautiful is hard to I me. Mean, sure. We agree on that. A beautiful looking film, but I, I found it. Uh, I found it horrific. So. I found it horrifically boring. Horrifically boring. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Uh, I saw. I, I I was fortunate enough to see it in a theater without any knowing, no pre knowledge. I feel like that's the best way. Marketing really ruins movies today. I agree. It, it, I agree. It tells you like, tell me everything that I'm gonna get so I know why I'm buying this ticket, and then you've ruined the experience. That's why I think I think seeing a movie at a film festival or seeing an indie movie, a lot of times when I watch an indie film, I only know the title and the basic premise. So I don't, I haven't read anything, I just sit down and watch it. Um, and I think that's a better way to experience a film, which is why I think that so many movies at film festivals, especially Sundance, they get these glowing reviews, and then by the time you finally see them, they've been over-marketed and the marketing ruins the movie. Well, so my, my problem is, is I'm, I'm a difficult person, I think. And so there'll be these movies that people will love, like Bridesmaids. People will love this movie. And I'll go and I'll see it and I'll hate it. Um, and then there'll be movies that like everybody hates and then I'll see it and I'll love it. So that's happened enough times that it's not a fluke. And so usually what I do is I try to read as little as possible until after I've seen the movie. And then I'm like, like for instance, um, A Star is Born. I loathed that movie. And everyone, everyone was like losing their minds over it. And I hated it. And all I knew about it was that everyone thought it was wonderful. Cause you, I, you can't, I couldn't keep that out, right? Cause it's like, everyone's raving about this movie. And then it was like, I saw it. Um, and I just, it just made me so mad. And once upon a time in Hollywood, again, I didn't read any details. All I knew was that everyone loved it. And I went and I saw it and I hated it. Um, so I, I try to keep the sort of that, that critique at arm's bay just to kind of, you know, see, see what my opinion is unprejudiced. And then afterwards I go and I read and I'm like, oh yeah, we were in total disagreement. Well, I, I I hear what you're saying. That's often my experience with um, seeing films. I didn't I didn't really particularly love Bradley Cooper's performance in S Star Is Born. I thought it was like a he sort of mumbled his way through it. They should have had subtitles for him. But um, I did have the experience in high school of loathing John Hughes movies. Mm. I did I hated those movies as a kid because uh, I thought it did not in any way, shape, or form represent any of the people that I knew. And I thought it was just about rich white kids. And I had no, uh, I, I just, I could not relate. Plus the fact that like, there's a one character in 16 Candles, uh, the Asian character, what's his name? Long Duck Dong, where they just play a gong every time he entered the scene, which I thought that's kind of racist to me. I thought that was kind of annoying, not really funny. I I, I had a, a friend um, throughout like junior high and high school was Chinese and it just, bugged me that that was how that character was handled. I mean, so, look at Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Well, yeah, I hated that one too. But See, I loved that movie. Oh, really? I did. I actually, that's my favorite Indiana Jones movie, which I know is a very controversial opinion. Um, controversial, the best one is the first one, I think. That Everyone has their own opinion. Well, there, um, there you are. This is where we, this is where we part. I with. just, I, I, yeah, you can, I'll take Indiana Jones, the Temple of Doom, and you can have Midsummer. Well, um, the dance number of uh, Indiana Jones is pretty good. And I don't know, I just, I loved the, oh, uh, the bugs and all that stuff. Um, but in my film theory course, 
when I talk about sort of like post-colonialism, I'm going to talk about how problematic that movie is because yeah. ev everything is problematic nowadays. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's a whole other, let's, let's put a pin in that. Let's discuss <laughs> okay. the next time you are on, okay. which is going to be soon, because uh, this is a great conversation. I knew it would be when you were on the watch party and we, you, I, I just was hearing a lot of things you were saying. I thought, oh my gosh, we got it. And then I didn't realize that we had had, you know, your book, we'd run that excerpt on the Film Threat website. I will put the link in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening, um, if you're listening, you can also watch this on YouTube. But uh, include, I will include links so people can find you. But um, Dahlia Schweitzer, this has uh, been a pleasure. Uh, going viral, zombies, viruses, and the end of the world, um, which is basically you're predicting the future. I know it was when when all this the pandemic stuff started happening. It became it was almost I kind of felt a little bit like I'd been sort of like it was I was being punked, you know, or like it was like you were saying you were talking about people's dreams, and I just felt like it was. And I don't know that anyone will get this. I even um, I'm friends with the actor Enrico Colantoni, who was in Contagion, and he didn't get this. And so I was like, okay, nobody will understand this because I'm just too weird. But when all this stuff was starting to happen, I went to Whole Foods and right at the entrance, they had a huge display of Forsythia. Do you get it? I feel like nobody will get it except for no. me. So in, in the movie Contagion, um, Jude Law's character is trying to oh, push right. for yes. Scythia. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm like innocently walking down the street and there's this huge display of Forsythia at the Whole Foods. And I was like, I like kind of feel like I like sort of like look over my shoulder. Real? Wait, real? Like, in real life. This was like in March in New York. I walk into the my like the Whole Foods and there's this huge, huge display for of Forsythia for sale. Um, like, you know, the actual, like the flowers, the, you know, and I was like, okay, either like someone at Whole Foods is laughing. Like, so, like there's just, there's no, I don't believe in coincidence like that. I mean, it just was so crazy. And it was like, you know, all these things kept happening. And then, you know, when Trump started calling it, you know, the Chinese virus, um, and it was, just, I was just like, I felt like I was like hitting my head against the wall because it was like, I know how this movie ends. Yeah. You know, it's like we've like we 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 need to have learned something from this. You know, like it was just driving me crazy. And then um, when they were when they were talking when um, I can't remember if it was like the 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 alt right people were saying that they were going to like weaponize it uh, and they were going to go and they were going to like you know basically like turn it into this sort of like um, you know bioterror or something. And I was just like, oh my god, like enough. You know, it was just like everything was just so predictable. It's like when you watch a horror movie and you get annoyed because everything is like, it's just too on the nose. Yeah. And it's like, I felt like I was living through that and it was driving me crazy. Um, and then now we've gone off the reservation. And that, no, wait a sec. Is that, did you take a picture of it and put it on your Instagram? The Forsythia? Yeah. Um, I am sure it's on, at least on my Twitter. I'll, <laughs> I'll find it. I'll tag you in it. But okay, yeah. Good. Like no, nobody got it. I was like, I'm the only weirdo who's free, losing my mind over this. Oh my God. Well, and this... I, I sent the picture to Enrico because I was like, well, he's in contagion. If anyone's going to get it, he's going to get it. And he was like, I don't, he's like, I don't get it. That's like talking to William Shatner about episodes of Star Trek. I know. He's like, I don't know. He doesn't even know what Tranya is. <laughs> so. Um, Dahlia Schweitzer, thank you so much for being on the Film Threat Podcast. This was an absolute, you're going to be back. You're going to be back. I'd be delighted. Because this is too, this was too good of a conversation. And I get to talk to you about things I don't normally get to talk about uh, with uh, filmmakers. So this was awesome. I'd be delighted to come back. Awesome.